What's going on guys? My name is Rahul and welcome to the very first tutorial of Swell Framework. Well I know most of you guys are here on this channel for the first time and also probably you are wondering that what the heck is this RDH code. Well this is our e-learning channel for the people who wants to learn how to code. So you are going to see a lot of tutorials and courses from this channel in the future. Now let's just get on the topic. In this series we will start from scratch and learn the various concepts in Svelte. In this introductory video I'll briefly talk about what's and why's of Svelte and also what you need to have to get started with Svelte. Alright let's begin with what is Svelte. Svelte is a component framework you can use to build high performance web applications. What is component framework? Well a component framework helps you write application code in a declarative manner. But what do we mean by declarative? If you work with some of the programming languages like C or C++ for example, you are probably aware of the imperative programming model, where we usually list down the steps explicitly and ask the library to do one thing after the other. In the declarative version though, we are simply saying that what outcome we want. We just have to tell Svelte what we want the UI to look like and it will take care of the rest. It's a lot easier to read and write and there is no code duplication. So you now know what is Svelte. It is a component framework for building web applications and you can use it to progressively build an existing application or build an entire single page application from scratch. But the more interesting question is why Svelte? Or how does Svelte is better than compared to other frameworks or libraries like React and Vue? The first thing is that unlike React or Vue, which do a bulk of their work in the browser, Svelte shifts that work into a compiled steps. That happens when you build your application. And because of this, there is no need to bundle the framework code. And so the bundle size is smaller. Of course, this is something that happens behind the scenes, which you don't have to worry about when writing code. What you do have to worry about though, is the developer experience. If you worked with React or Vue, you would find yourself with a problem of what to choose for state management. Redux or Vuex are not the most simplest libraries to understand. Svelte on the other hand provides Svelte stores out of the box, which is really easy to work with and not just that Svelte has a ton of features which makes your life easier by providing answers to your questions that you might have when building almost every application. Like how do we add motion and element transitions? How do we handle user input via form elements? How do we add CSS to our components without polluting the global scope? How do we edit the head tag for our single page applications from within our component and a lot more. Svelte has you covered. When starting out with web development, it is very comforting to have one recommended approach to do something and not to be worried about making a wrong decision. Okay, I can say that Svelte is going to be a great addition to your skill set. Now then what are the prerequisites to get started with Svelte? Well, HTML, CSS and JavaScript fundamentals are absolutely necessary. For this course, I'll also making be use of ESX plus features. So a knowledge of modern JavaScript is also essential. You don't have to be an expert in these prerequisites, but there are a few modern JavaScript features that make it so much easier to write Svelte code. My goal is to make sure we all advance from a complete beginner to be an expert in Svelte. Okay, that's all for this video. If you find this video informative, then hit the like button. And if you want to continue this series, then do subscribe to this channel. I'm going to upload tutorials of this series daily. So if you are a subscriber of this channel, then you won't miss any update. Alright then, with this introduction, let's get started with a simple hello world application in the next video. What's going on guys? Today on RDH Code, we're gonna create our very first Svelte application. But before that, we have to set up our development environment so that we can write our very first line of code. So let's begin. For Svelte, you need two things to be installed in your PC, Node and a text editor of your choice. For Node, go to nodejs.org. And then here you're gonna see this type of stuff. What you need to do here is click on this green button guys. Now look, download the LTS version of the Node.js. This LTS stands for long term support. Means it's a stable version of Node.js guys. And why is it green? Who knows, maybe because of this. Now download and install it. If you already have it installed, make sure that you have the latest updated version of Node.js. Now you can choose any text editor you like, but I personally use Visual Studio Code. You can download and install it from code.visualstudio.com. After installing the VS Code, go in the extension tab and install the Svelte for VS Code and Svelte 3 snippets extension. Together they provide syntax highlighting, code snippet, formatting support, auto completion and a lot more features specifically for Svelte. Now before we begin with the code, there is one point I want to highlight. When it comes to the world of Svelte, there are two things you should know about, Svelte and Svelte Kit. Svelte Kit is an application framework powered by Svelte. 
If you are familiar with React and Vue, you might be aware of frameworks Next and Next.js. Next.js is a framework powered by React and Next.js is a framework powered by Vue. Similar to that, SwelteKit is a framework powered by Swelt. It adds features like routing and server-side rendering which are great for building medium to large scale applications. What I always recommend is to learn React before Next, Vue before Next and of course Swelt before SwelteKit. So in this tutorial series, we are gonna learn Swelt first and then we will head towards the Swelt Kit. The reason I bring this up is because we can create a new Swelt app by following instructions on the Swelt side as well as on the Swelt Kit side. As beginners though, we are going to follow the instructions of these two sides. Alright, now to get us started, I have created a folder called Swelt and opened VS Code inside that folder. This folder is going to be our workspace for the rest of our series. To create a brand new Swelt project, all we need is one line of code. In the terminal here, run the command npx dgit swelt.js slash template followed by the name of project, let's just call it rdh code. The dgit command simply clone the swelt template repo without the git history. The command takes the few seconds to run and once the command completes, you will see a new folder called rdh code. This folder contains our swelt application. To run this application, first navigate inside the folder, so cd rdh code. Then run the command yarn to install the dependencies. If you are using npm, you have to run npm install. Once the command completes, run the command yarn dev or npm run dev. The command will set up a development server on localhost port 8080. I can control click to this link and head towards the browser. Here you can see that our application is up and running. By default UI features, here is a heading that says hello world followed by the line of text that tells us to check the Swell tutorial to learn how to build Swell tabs. But you guys don't have to click on this. Why? Because you have this. So stay tuned with this series and you will be pro in Swell in no time. And if you didn't yet subscribe to this channel, then do a subscribe so you can never miss a piece of knowledge of Swell. So subscribe to this channel and trust me, this series is going to be LEGEND! Wait for it! Dairy! Okay, what's going on everyone? Welcome to the RDH code. So we finally finished setting up our development environment. Now it's also really important that you understand the files and folders present in the generated project and how to control the flows when you run the application. Let's take a look at that in this video. I have opened the RDH code project in VS Code. And you can see that at the root level we have 4 folders and 5 files to begin with. Let's start with the important bits in package.json. This file contains the dependencies and the scripts required for the project. You can see that we are using Swelt version 3 and that is listed as a dev dependency. Swelt is only used during the compilation phase and never bundled into the code that is sent to the browser. We then have Rollup which is a model bundler and a whole lot of roller plugins listed as dev dependencies. Rollup is responsible for transforming the Swelt code we write into JavaScript code that the browsers can understand. There is one dependency which is the server CLI. It allows us to run a static file server. We also have three scripts, dev for development, built to create a production ready version of the application and start for sub CLI to serve the built application straightforward to package.json. As you can see, next we have the configuration file for rollup, rollup.config.js. This is the config file that is used when we run the command yarn dev or yarn build. If you are interested in the various configuration, I recommend you to take a look at rollup documentation. Next we have the yarn log file. Based on whether you prefer npm or yarn as a package manager, you are going to see yarn log or package log file. They simply ensure consistent installations of your dependencies and you don't have to really worry about them. We also have git ignore and readme file. Alright, next let's talk about the folders. The first one is node modules. This is the folder in which all the dependencies are installed. It is generated when you run the yarn command or npm install command. The next folder is the public folder. This folder contains static assets that are published when you want to go live with your application. It contains three files. We have a fab icon which you see in the browser tab and is nothing Swelt specific. We also have a global CSS file which includes styles that are applied to our entire application. And finally, we have an index.html file, which is the only HTML file you are going to have in your application. We are building single page application right now and this is it. The view might dynamically change in the browser, but it is this HTML file that gets served up. Typically you are not going to add any code in this file, maybe some changes in the head, but definitely not in the body tag. You want Swell to control the UI, and for that purpose we have CSS 
and js file so slash build slash bundle dot css slash build slash bundle dot js these files are from the build folder which get generated when you run or build your application now please make a note of this empty body tag as we will come back to it shortly the next folder is the scripts folder which contains a file pertaining to typescript setup since we are going to learn swell with just javascript we don't have to worry about this for now the next folder is the source folder which is the folder we will be working with the most during our development. The starting point for our Svelte application is main.js. In main.js we import the root components which is app component and invoke it as a function specifying the document body as the target element. And if you can recollect we have an empty body element in our ntext.html file. So everything inside this body tag will be managed by Svelte. For the application, the app component is rendered inside the body element. That brings us to the app component which is present in app.svelte. Now the .svelte file extension I bet is something new to you if you are learning about Svelte for the first time. We will talk about this .svelte files in the next video. But for now let me tell you that it is a file where you specify the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript corresponding to a portion of the UI you see in the browser. You can see here we have a script block with a variable called name. For the HTML, we have the main HTML tag with an h1 tag and a paragraph tag. This is the text we see in the browser below the HTML. We also have some styles specified within our style block. The app.swell file pretty much represents the UI you see in the browser. So that is the folder structure of Svelte application created using the dgit command. Next, let's understand the control flow when you run this application in the terminal. When you run the command yarn dev, index.html file is served in the browser. Index.html contains a reference to bundle.js. The bundle.js is your main.js file compiled to a JavaScript format that the browser can understand. The Svelte code renders itself within the body tag. So if I inspect the heading element, you can see the main tag as a child of the body tag. This is nothing but our app component and the name of course is a name from main.js which gets replaced in the HTML because of the Svelte compiler. So hello name replace name with world which is the hello world and that is what you see in the browser. We will of course learn more about this Svelte magic in the next videos. So this is pretty much all about the project structure for now. The control flow from package.json, dev script to index.html, bundle.js script to main.js and finally app.svelte. Now I'm pretty sure this file extension which is .svelte is new to you. So let's discuss more about that in the next video. What's up everyone, today on RDH code, we are going to learn about the .svelte file. In the previous video, I talked about the .svelte file in one or two sentences I guess. In this video, let's understand a bit more about this file type. A .svelte file is a custom file format where we write our code using a superset of HTML to describe a portion of the UI. For example, in our project we have one .svelte file namely app.svelte, which is responsible for the heading and the paragraph in the UI. So a .svelte file is responsible for the portion of the UI. Next, let's understand the code that goes inside a .svelte file. Each .svelte file consists of three sections, script, markup and style. The script section is where the data and the logic for the markup is maintained. So you could say it is like the JavaScript of your UI. The markup section is the HTML of your UI. It defines the structure. The last section which is the style section, where you specify the styles related to the HTML written in your markup section. The script section goes within the script tag, the style section goes within the style tag and everything else is a part of the markup section. As you can see, HTML, CSS and JavaScript, that is all you need to define a fully functional and styled portion of the user interface. So in Svelte, instead of dividing the codebase into three huge layers which then come together to form the UI, it is instead divided into one or more Svelte files where each file is responsible for its own markup styles and logic. And what you do have to keep in your mind though is that the browser does not understand what a .svelte file is. So rollup with the Svelte plugin is going to parse this file extract each of the three sections and assemble them back into a format that browsers can understand. Since we are using the Svelte template repo, all of this is already taken care for us. Alright, now that we have a bit more information about the Svelte file, let's discuss two more points which will set us up to finally get started with some code. The first point is about components. Right now we have a Svelte file called app.svelte. In Svelte, a .svelte file represents a component. A Svelte app can contain one or more of these components. When learning Svelte as a beginner though, there is a lot to learn with just one Svelte file. We don't have to worry about multiple Svelte files and the component architecture to begin with. So to keep this simple, you are first going to focus on all the concepts that can be learned using just one Svelte file. When we have a good understanding of how the script markup and style section work together, we will then dive deep into the world of concepts in Svelte. 
I promise you we will come back to this topic of components later on in this series when it will make much more sense than right now. All we need is just one app.swell file to understand a whole bunch of concepts that Swelt has to offer. The second point is about what we are going to learn pretty much for in the upcoming videos. A minute ago I mentioned that a .swell file contains markup as well as the script which contains the logic for that markup. Let me tell you that a major portion of working with a .swell file is wiring up the data and logic to the markup. That is connecting the data present in the script section to the HTML present in the markup section. This is the declarative programming approach I was mentioning in the very first video. All you have to do is let Swelt know how you want to bind your data to the HTML and Swelt will take care of the rest. It is this part of letting Swelt know what exactly we want to UI to look like. So let's finally get started with some code in the next video. What's up everyone, welcome to the IDH code. In the last video we talked about single file components which is basically a Swelt file in our project. We have one Swelt file which is app.swelt. We learned that a Swelt file can contain three sections namely the script section, the markup section and the style section. I also mentioned that the script section contains the data and the logic for the markup section which ultimately is responsible for the UI. In this video let's understand how to bind the data from the script section to the markup section more specifically. Let's start with binding text from the script to the markup. Now we want to start fresh so in main.js remove the props object. That is to do with components which we will take a look at further down in the series. In app.swelt let's have an empty script section and for the markup let's have an empty main tag. We could remove this as well but it's center align the text which I like to have for the videos in the series. The style section can remain untouched. Alright now for some code in the markup if we were to type hello Rahul and take a look at the browser you can see the name being displayed. However this is static text which can never change. Typically in web applications though the UI is data driven. Content you see in the browser can be dynamic and needs to change based on the application state. So we need to maintain the data in the script section and then bind the data to the HTML in the script section. So we can define a constant name and set it to Rahul. Now we have to bind this name to the HTML defined below. And to do that we use a pair of curly braces. So within the main tag instead of Rahul specify curly braces and within the curly braces we specify the constant name. If you now take a look at the browser our output is still the same. Change name to monkey d luffy and we see the text hello monkey d luffy. So what happens here is that the name constant inside curly braces is replaced with its value. So name is replaced by the string monkey d luffy. In fact within curly braces you can specify any javascript expression you want to. I can change name to 5 plus 5 and we see hello 10 in the browser. The curly braces support any valid javascript expression. So this is the first fundamental concept in Swelt. Binding text from the script section to the markup. In the next video let's take a look at binding HTML. What's up guys. In the previous video we learned about the usage of curly braces to bind text to the UI. What you have to keep in mind about binding text is that strings are inserted as plain text so HTML characters have no special meaning. Sometimes though we might have to render real HTML in the browser. A possible use case is when a user is asked to fill a form where one of the fields is a rich text editor, the user would be allowed to bold or italicize the input. And if you want to display that input value, let's say in a read only mode, you need to render the value as HTML with the bold text, font colors and whatnot. In such scenario we can use the at HTML prefix within curly braces. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say we have a data property whose value is a string enclosed with both tags. Let's add a new constant so const channel and this is going to be equal to rdh code. But within a pair of bold tags if we try to bind this data to our markup with curly braces you can see that the value gets rendered as a plain text. The bold tags is also rendered in the UI. To render proper HTML, we add the add HTML prefix. So within the curly braces, add HTML as a prefix before channel. Now if you save the file and take a look at the browser, we have the channel name rendered in bold. Like I mentioned, you would at least once in a complex project come across the need to render HTML in the browser. And this is the way to go about it. Well, there is a word of warning though. When you use the add HTML prefix, it is very important to keep in mind that you should only render the content that you trust. If you are using a third party API, it is very risky to use the at HTML prefix because it might lead to cross site scripting attacks and making your application vulnerable to security threats. Let me show a very simple scenario which could cause anxiety for your users. I am going to copy paste a new constant within the script section. So const hack 
which is simply an anchor tag on click of which you alert the text you have been hacked the anchor text itself is win a prize so now bind this to the markup using the html prefix so add html hack save the file head to the browser you can see that when i click this win a prize link i get an alert you have been hacked of course we as a developers know this is a simple alert but for user browsing your site this is definitely not favorable also hackers are capable of injecting much worse threats into your site than a simple alert dialog so use the at html prefix to render real html but be very cautious of what you are rendering thank you guys for watching make sure to subscribe to the channel and i'll see you guys in the next video what's up guys welcome to the rdh code in this video let's take a look at dynamic attributes in swelt it is possible to bind data to HTML attributes such as ID, class, style, and even Boolean attributes such as disabled for an input element. The same curly braces we have learnt about can be used for attribute binding as well. Let's take a look at an example. I am going to add a constant, so const heading ID is equal to heading. Now we can bind this to an HTML element ID property. So as to tag, this is our heading and ID is going to be equal to curly braces and we specify heading id. Let's save this and head towards the browser. You can see the heading element is being displayed. If you inspect the element, you can see that the id is in fact heading. If you are rendering a list of elements and you want each element to have a unique id, dynamic attribute binding will help you. And what is cool about attribute binding is that you can use a shorthand if the attribute name and value are the same. So if we were to have a constant called just id instead of having id is equal to id. We can specify a shorthand of just the curly braces with id inside. Svelte will infer that you are trying to bind to the id attribute. Take a look at the browser, you can see that the id attribute is still present with the value of heading. Now attribute binding can also be used to bind boolean attributes. The behavior though is slightly different. I am going to define another constant. So const disabled is equal to true. Now we can create a button and set the disabled attribute equal to the disabled constant. So button, the text is bind and we can set disabled is equal to disabled or use the shorthand and specify disabled within the curly braces. Save the file and head towards the browser. If you inspect the element, the disabled attribute is present. If I now change the disabled value to false, the button is no longer disabled. But if you inspect the element, you can see that there is no disabled attribute. So in the case of boolean attributes where their mere existence applies true, as in the case of disabled attribute we have just seen, the HTML attribute will not even be included in the rendered button element if the disabled property is false. So these are the two examples of attribute binding. When building applications, a more common niche for attribute binding is binding to the class attribute on an element. It's pretty similar to what we have just seen, but there is an additional detail to class binding. Let's take a look at that in next video. So today on RDH code, we're gonna learn about class attributes. In the previous video, we learned about attribute binding. In this video, let's continue with attribute binding but focus on one specific attribute, which is the class attribute. Let's start off with the class attribute in its most basic form. In the style section, I'm going to define a new class. The class name is underline and we simply set text decoration to underline. I'm going to add an s2 tag with the text as underlying text to apply the underlying class we have just defined. We specify the class attribute and then assign the class name. If we take a look at the browser, the class and its styling is applied on the HTML element. Now this is an example of static class. Static classes are the ones that never change and will always be present on the HTML element. But in a web application, you might want to manipulate an element's list of classes in other words. You need dynamic classes which allows you to add or remove classes when things change in your application. Dynamic classes are similar to static classes. But we have to use curly braces in order to bind a JavaScript expression to a class attribute. Let's understand with an example. I'm going to begin by adding two new classes. Danger where the color is red and success where the color is olive. In the script section, let me define a new constant called status and set it to danger. Now in the markup section, we can bind this status value to the class attribute using curly braces. So as to tag, the text is status and class is equal to within curly braces status. If we now go back to the browser, we can see the status text with red color. If I inspect the element, you can see danger is applied as a class which is the value of the status property. Change it to success and the success class is applied. This sort of class binding allows you to change the class dynamically based on some data. 
For example, if there are errors in a form field, you might want to apply the danger class. If there is valid data in the form, you might want to apply the success class. So this is pretty much the basic of finding classes in Svelte. However, there is more to it since the class attribute accepts any JavaScript expression, we can do pretty cool things like conditional binding. So in the style section, I'm going to take the context of displaying movie's names. If the movie is promoted movie, we want the font style to be italicized. We can now add a new constant called is promoted that serves as the condition for the promoted class to be applied. Now in the markup, we can use the ternary operator to conditionally apply the promoted class only if his promoted is true. So as to tag again, the text is going to be the movie title and then class binding. And within the curly braces, we are going to specify if is promoted is true, apply the promoted class. If not, don't apply it. If you take a look at the browser, you can see that the text movie title is italicized and the promoted class is applied on the actual element. If I change is promoted to false, the class and styling is removed from the element. This pattern of conditionally applying classes is so common, Swell provides a special directive that allows you to toggle classes based on some conditions. Now a directive is like a custom attribute that controls the element's behavior in some way. In our case, it controls the toggling of classes on an element. So instead of classes promoted, we can have the directive class colon and the class name. We want to apply which is promoted and this should be applied based on the value of is promoted. So what happen is that the JavaScript expression is promoted is evaluated first. If it is true, promoted is applied as a class on the element, else it is not. If I set is promoted to true again and go back to the browser, you can see the promoted class being applied and the text is italicized. Of course, this class directive also has a shorthand syntax. If the directive class name and its value match, we can concise this line of code. So if our constant is just promoted, instead of is promoted, we can completely remove the equal signs and the right hand side. So class colon promoted, head back to the browser and our class binding works as expected. So this is pretty much is about binding class and conditionally binding classes in Svelte. Thank you guys for watching, make sure to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. What's going on everyone, now today on RDH code, we're gonna learn about conditional rendering. When you are building Svelte applications, you may often need to show or hide some HTML based on certain conditions in Svelte. Well, Svelte makes it really simple to do that by providing three special HTML blocks. They are if block, else block and the else if block. The three blocks work similar to any other programming language where we use if else and else if statements. The only difference here is that we render HTML elements rather than execute some logic. Let's understand how they work with an example. Let's consider a very simple scenario given a variable we need to display. If it is 0, a positive number, a negative number or not a number. Let's begin by defining a new constant so const num is equal to 0. First let's check if the number is 0 or not. We begin by adding an if block, a syntax is curly braces, then the hash symbol, followed by if keyword, this is followed by the expression we want to evaluate. Our expression is num is equal to 0. If it evaluates to true, we need to output some text. So let's add an s2 tag with the text, the number is 0. The hash if within curly braces represents the opening of the if block. We close this if block by adding another pair of curly braces. But this time, a forward slash followed by the if keyword. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, we should see the text, the number is 0. If I change the number to 5, the expression evaluates to false and the heading is not rendered in the browser. Fairly simple as you can see. But let's now improve this. Instead of not displaying anything, let's display that the number is not 0. And for that, we make a use of the else block right after the as to tag. We are going to add another block represented by curly braces. But this block is not the start or the end. It is a continuation block and is represented by a colon. This is followed by the else keyword. Within the else block, we add another heading that says the number is not 0. So as to tag, the number is not 0. If we save the file and take a look at the browser, the text now reads the number is not 0. We are conditionally rendering our HTML based on data defined in the script section. If the number is 0, we display the first heading. Else we display the second heading. Now when you just have an either or condition, the if else blocks are sufficient. But if you have more number of conditions, then you have to make use of the else if block as well. Let's add a few more conditional HTML elements. Let's display if the number is 0 or negative or positive or not a number. 
Now we are already checking if the number is 0. Next let's check if the number is negative or positive. So right after the first S2 element we add the else if block. The syntax is curly braces colon else space if and this is followed by the condition. The condition is that num is less than 0. Now if this condition is true, we render another heading that says the number is negative. Make a copy of these two lines, paste it, change condition is num greater than 0 and the text negative to positive. So if the number is greater than 0, we output the text the number is positive. Finally, if none of the conditions are satisfied, we display that it is not a number. Let's save the file and verify if this code works. Right now, num is set to 5 and hence we see that it's positive. Let me change it to minus 5 and you can see that the number is now negative. If I assign a string, you can see that it is not a number. A conditional rendering markup is working as expected. Alright, that is about the if else and else if logical blocks in Swelt. They are used to conditionally render HTML elements in the UI. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. What's up guys, now in this video we'll see how list rendering works. So when you build web applications, a common scenario is to display a list of items. For example, a list of names, a list of products, a list of courses, so on and so far. So what we want is to repeat some HTML for each item in the list in Swelt. We can achieve that using the each block. Let's understand the syntax with an example. In the script section, I'm going to define a constant called name which is an array of three strings, Bruce, Clark, and Diana. Our aim is to display this list of names in the UI, for which we need to use the each block. If you can recollect from the previous video, you know that we use curly braces to represent the block in the marker. So within the main tag, I'm going to add a pair of curly braces. We represent the starting of a block with a hash symbol, and this block is the each block. We end this block with curly braces, a forward slash, and the name of the block again. Now we need a way to get hold of each name in the names array. And the syntax for that is names as name and this is swelt specific syntax. So let's understand what is happening here. In each block names is the data defined in the script section. And name is simply analyzed to refer to the current item in the loop. Since we have the each block basically iterates three times with names referring to each of the names. This name is what we bind to the HTML using curly braces. So within the each block. Add an S2 tag, we are going to bind the text name. So first iteration name is equal to the string Bruce. Second iteration name is equal to Clark. And third iteration name is equal to Diana. If we save the file and take a look at the browser, we see the name being displayed. If you inspect element, you can see that the S2 tag is repeated three times. And the inner text is Bruce, Clark and Diana. So the S2 element has repeated itself for each name in the names array. Sometimes you might also want to get hold of the index when rendering a list. For that, Swell provides the index in the H block, which you can use if required. So instead of just name, we get hold of name, comma, index. Then while binding, we can also bind the index. Index plus 1. If we take a look at the browser, we can see 1, 2, 3 to the names. Index starts at 0 and hence index plus 1 will represent 1, 2 and 3. Now a small variation of this is iterating over an array of the objects. Let's quickly take a look at an example. I'm going to create a new constant called full names and this is going to be equal to an array of objects. So we have first name and last name, Bruce Wing, Clark Kent and Princess Diana. Now the aim is to display the list of full names in the UI. If you have understood the first example, this should be fairly straightforward to understand. Within the main tag at the top, I'm going to add another each block. So hashtag or hash symbol followed by the keyword each. We also need to close the each block using the forward slash. Now for the iteration, we are iterating over full names and we are going to analyze each object as names. We can also get hold of index within the each block. I'm going to add an S2 tag and we can render index plus 1. But this time while rendering the first and last names, we need to access name.first and name.last. Name here refers to each object in the iteration. If we now save the file and head to the browser, we should be able to see Bruce Wayne, Clark Kent and Princess Diana. And of course, the number are also displayed. Alright, you should now have a good understanding of the each block and its usage to render a list of elements in Svelte. But there is a still a missing piece which is a key expression that can be provided for an each block. 
let's understand more about keys and lists in the next video going on everyone welcome to rdh code so in this video let's understand about the key expression when rendering a list of elements in svelte it's a common practice and also recommended to provide a key expression for the each block whenever possible to specify the key expression in the each block opening within parentheses we specify a unique value for our second each block this could be the name itself since it's unique within the name array for our first each block we could specify the name object itself but strings or numbers are recommended since they allow the identity to persist even when objects themselves change so we can specify name dot first if we now save the file and go back to the browser there is absolutely no change to the list of elements being displayed however the key expression is used by swell to diff the list when there are data changes or in simple words the key expression helps swell to identify which items in a list have changed are added or removed and it plays a crucial role in handling ui updates correctly and efficiently what i want to do is show you an example where the absence of the key expression can actually lead to bugs in the ui i'm going to use code sandbox for this purpose now this example uses concepts in swell that we haven't covered yet so let's focus on just the each block and the ui on right hand side i will leave a link to this demo in the description for you to have a look at when watching the video in the script section we have a constant called names with four strings one piece demon slayer attack on titan and tokyo revengers so who doesn't know what's this for them these are the names of anime shows by the way i don't think you guys don't know about what anime is i mean come on everybody knows about one piece eh so in the template we have the each block iterating over the list of names in each iteration we display the name and we also have an input element to accept the last name as the anime ratings out of 10 as you can see this in the ui on the right hand side Now along with this list we also have a button called shuffle which simply shuffles the list of names in the array. So if I click on this button you can see that the list in the UI is shuffled every time. Now let's enter some text in the input boxes. I'm going to refresh and then I'm going to rate these enemies and in advance these are some random ratings okay? So don't get offended. Well that's another thing that one piece is the best. <laughs> so I'm going to rate Tokyo Revengers 8, One Piece 10 of course, Demon Slayer 8 and attack on titan 9 now i want you to closely observe what happens when i click on the shuffle button you can see that names are shuffled but the ratings don't shuffle so we now have demon slayer 10 and one piece 8 which obviously isn't what we expect okay because it's not right i click on shuffle again and the same things happens this is the drawback of not using the key expression when rendering a list of elements when you don't specify the unique key swell simply patches the value This behavior causes the bug when working with temporary state like the dom state or when adding or removing elements to the list. If we now add the key expression name, refresh, enter the ratings, one piece 10, demon slayer 8, attack on titan 9 and tokyo revengers 8. And now click on shuffle, we can see that the behavior is as expected. The anime shows shuffle, but this time ratings of each anime stuck with them. So the key expression is pretty important when rendering a list of elements. A typical value to provide the key expression is the id property in an object. But any unique value will serve the same purpose. I wanted to ensure you understand why we use that expression and hopefully this video did that. All right, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. What is up everyone? So today on RDH Code we're going to learn about event handling in Svelte. you most likely wanted to respond to events for example if a user clicks a button and submits a form or even just moves their mouse you want your application to handle the events and execute some code in this video let's see how to handle events with swelt our example is going to be that of a simple click counter you can click on a button and the count value increments i'm going to begin by defining a new variable let count is equal to 0 Make sure to use let and not const as we are going to change the count value in the markup section. Let's add a button. So button, the init text is going to have a binding to the count variable. So count and within curly braces the variable count. And now our next step is to listen to the click event on this button. Now to listen to event in Swell, we use the on directive. The syntax is on colon followed by the event name. For our example, it is click. To this we assign a handler. So on the right hand side begin with a pair of curly braces and within curly braces the handler is an arrow function where we are going to increment the value of count by 1 So on the right hand side within parentheses 
count is equal to count plus 1. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, we have the count as 0. When I click on the button, count value increments by 1 and the updated value is rendered in the UI. And what we have seen here is an example of inline event handlers. The code to execute is present in the same line as the on directive. This is great for simple logic but more often than not the logic for many event handlers will be complex. So keeping your JavaScript code in the markup section is not the best idea. In such cases you can define a function in the script section and assign that function as the event handler. Let's understand with an example. In the script section I'm going to define a function called handle click. So function handle click where we increment the value of count y1 so count plus equal 1. In the markup I'm going to make a copy of the button but this time instead of using the inline event handler we are going to assign handle click. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser click on the second button and the counter still works as expected. Alright this is pretty much the basics of event handling in Svelte. Use the on directive followed by the event name followed by the JavaScript code to execute which can be an inline function or a function that contains more complex logic. Now there are a few more points to discuss about event handling. Let's quickly look at those. Sometimes you might want to access the event object which gives more information about the event itself. Luckily for us Svelte automatically passes the event object as an argument to the event handler. So in the handle click function we can specify a parameter called event and let's simply log it to the console. If I now go back to the browser, open the console tab click on the second button you can see that the event object is logged to the console. This gives us a lot of information about the event itself. It's a mouse event gives us the coordinates of the click event on the screen tells us that the target is a button and the types of mouse event is a click event. This event object is exactly what you would find with pure JavaScript and is nothing specific to Svelte but definitely comes in handy when dealing with the form inputs. What we do have to note here though is that the event object is automatically passed in only if you don't specify any arguments. If you do have to specify an argument the syntax is slightly different. Let me show that to you. For our counter instead of incrementing it by 1 let's say it accepts an increment size as its argument. For that we begin by changing the handler into an arrow function. This arrow function automatically receives the event object as its argument. We simply pass that on as an argument to handle click but after the first argument we can specify our on argument. Let's specify 5. Make a copy of this button and specify 10. Now for the handle click function I'm going to add a second parameter called step size and use that instead of 1. If you now go back to the browser click on the first button increments the count by 1. Click on the second button increments it by 5. Click on the third button increments it by 10. So if you ever need to pass arguments to your event handlers this is the way to go about it. Alright that is pretty much about the event handling in Svelte. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. Welcome back everyone to the RDH code. In this video let's learn about the fundamentals of working with forms in Svelte. If you are a front-end developer you probably know that a considerable amount of work has to do with building forms. So it's really important that we understand how to capture user inputs using various types of form controls. Well, we have inputs, text areas, single select controls, multi select controls, single checkbox, group of checkboxes, and of course, radio buttons. Once we capture the values from the user, we also have to learn how to submit those form values. We are not talking about submitting to an API, but having a submit button that can at least log the form data to the console is definitely required. As you can see we have a lot to learn about form handling which is why I have split this topic into two videos. In this video we will understand how to work with input text areas, single select drop down controls and multi select controls. In the next video we will learn about a single checkbox, group of checkboxes, radio buttons and also how to submit the form on a click of a button. Let's begin for our example. Let's consider a job application form where the user is required to fill in the details. To ensure our form doesn't look too bad, I'm going to add some CSS. So within the style block for our label, after an input element set display inline flex. I'm also going to comment out the center text alignment style. Alright now let's get started with our form. In the markup section, I'm going to add a form tag and within the form tag, I'm going to add a div tag. 
for our first form control and this form control is to gather the name of the user. So label text is going to be name and the for attribute is also going to be name. In the next line let's add an input. Input type equals text and id equals name which corresponds to the for attribute on the label element. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, we have our name form control. We can type in Rahul and input reflects that. However, the data is currently in the HTML section. We need to send it into the script section and for that purpose, Swell provides the bind directive. Now how does it work? Well, we begin by defining a variable that is going to keep track of the form control. So in the script section, I'm going to add new variable, let's call it form values. And this is going to be equal to an object. This property in turn will contain another property called name which will track the input control value that we have just created. So name and the initial value of name would be an empty string. Now you could omit the form values property but it makes this demo much easier as you are going to see in few minutes. Now once we have created the name variable we need to bind it to the form control. We do that using the bind directive so on the input element we bind to the value property and this is going to be equal to form values dot name. Now if you were to enter the name it would be tracked in the form values object. Let's stringify that object in the markup section to visualize how the data binding works. So above the form tag I'm going to add a div tag. Within the div tag I'm going to add a pre tag and then within curly braces json dot stringify form values and pass in null comma two to display in separate lines. If you now save the file and head to the browser, you can see that we have the form values object and the name form control in the form values object. We have the name property whose value is an empty string. If I type Rahul, you can see the same in our stringified representation. So we have the binding form, the HTML to the script data and back to the HTML. What is great about Swelt is that it understands the different types of form controls and bind values accordingly at the moment. You can see that if I type number, the value is still a string with double quotes. If I add type is equal to number, though the value is automatically converted into a number. You might think this is how it would normally work, but that's not the case in vanilla JavaScript. If you were to have type is equal to number, the value would still be a string. Swelt on the other hand takes care of the type conversion for us. So this is pretty much how the bind directive works. Let's now look at few more examples. Since the name controls was the first usage of the bind directive, I wanted to take some time explaining how it works. Now that you have a good idea, I'm going to go over the rest of the example fairly quicker. Alright, the second form control in our job applicant form is to collect the profile summary of the candidate. This requires three simple steps. Step 1, add a new property. So within form values, profile summary and set it to an empty string. Step 2, add the HTML. So div tag, within the div tag, the label text is going to be profile summary and in the text line, we are going to add a text area field. So text area ID is going to be equal to profile which should match the for attribute on the label and this can be a self-closing tag. Now for the step 3, we'll bind the profile summary property using the bind directive. So bind colon value is going to be equal to form values dot profile summary. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, we have our text area field type in our profile summary and the same can be seen in the form values object. I'm guessing you are now getting a hang of working with forms in Svelte. Let's take a look at the Slack dropdown next. Let's say that we need to ask the user from which country they are from. Again, this involves three simple steps. Step 1, create a new property. Create a new property called country and set it to an empty string. Step 2, add the HTML. Label 4 is equal to country. The text is going to be country. Now to keep this simple, we are going to add only three countries and I am going to copy paste the options. So the first option is select a country which has an empty value and then we have three countries Spain, Canada, United States and the corresponding values. Now for step 3 we bind the property using the bind directive. So on the select element bind to value form values dot country. 
If you now save the file and take a look at the browser, we have our Slack dropdown. Select a country and its value is reflected in the form values of Jack. United States, Canada and Spain. Now it's also possible to have a multi-slack dropdown. Let's say we need the job applicant to select a list of countries where they are willing to relocate. This again can be done in three simple steps. Step 1. Add a new property. Job location and the initial value is going to be an empty array. Remember, multiple values can be selected so the initial value is an empty array and not an empty string. Step 2. We add the HTML. Now this is the same HTML for selecting a country with some modifications. So let's make a copy of the code and make the necessary changes. Copy the div block, paste it. The first change is the text. Change it to job location. The second change is the for and id attributes. Change it to job hyphen location. So this is step 2. For step 3, bind the correct property to the bind directive. It is form values dot job location. The third and final change add the multiple attribute on the select HTML element. If you now save the file and head back to the browser, you can see that we have a multi select HTML element. I can select Spain and the form values object updates with the value. Hold Ctrl and click on United States that gets added to the form values object as well. Our multi select elements works as expected. So let's take a look at the second half of the topic in the next video. In the last video, we learned about the bind directive and its usage with input select areas, single select dropdowns, and multi select dropdowns. In this video, let's learn about its usage with a single checkbox, a checkbox group, a radio group, and let's also learn how to submit the form data. Alright, let's start with a single checkbox. Form control in our job applicant form, we want the user to let us know if they are okay with working remotely or not. Like in the case of other form controls, this also can be implemented in three simple steps. Step 1. Add a new property. Remote work and this is going to be initially false. A single checkbox typically indicates true or false, which is why we initialize the property with false. The checkbox by default is unchecked. Step 2. We are going to add the HTML. So, div tag input type is equal to checkbox, id is equal to remote work and after the input we are going to add a label for is going to be remote work and the text is going to be open to remote work with a caution mark. So that is step 2. Step 3. Find the property using the bind directive. Now for a checkbox we bind to the check property instead of the value property. And this is very important to make note of. So bind checked is going to be equal to form values dot remote work. Let's now save the file. Make sure the styles from before is not commented out. And now head back to the browser. We should be able to see our check box in our form values object. You can see that the value is false. If I check the check box, the value is now true. So based on the state of the check box, the value of the property will either be false or true. Now that we understand how a single checkbox works, let's understand how to work with multiple checkboxes or a checkbox group if you can call it that. In the job applicant form, we want the user to select a list of skills they are comfortable with. Let's add HTML, CSS and JavaScript as three checkboxes and the user can select more than one skill. Again, three simple steps. One, add a new property skill set. And this is an array as well, since the user can select multiple values. Step 2. Add the HTML. Now to save us some time, I'm going to copy paste the HTML and walk you through the code. We have the label for the checkbox group, which is skill set. Then we have three checkboxes. The first one is HTML. The label is HTML. And the value for the checkbox is also HTML. We have the for attribute on the label, which corresponds to the ID attribute on the checkbox. And of course, the input type is checkbox. Similarly, we have the second checkbox for the CSS. And the third checkbox for JavaScript. Now step 3, bind the property to each one of the three checkboxes. But this time, instead of binding to the check property, we bind to the group property. So bind group and this is going to be equal to form values dot skill set. I'm going to copy paste this on the other two inputs as well. If we now format the file, save it. And take a look at the browser, you can see three checkboxes for the skill set. Input in the form values of check, the property is an empty array. If I select HTML, 
the same is pushed onto the array. Select all three, all of them get pushed on the skill set array. Our checkbox group works as expected. Alright, let's take a look at the final form control, which is the radio group. Let's say we need the job applicant to select their years of experience. It could be either to 0 to 2 years, 3 to 5 years, 6 to 10 years, or 10 plus years. The user can select only one option, which is why video group is the best form control for this purpose. Let's see how to implement it again in three simple steps. First step create a new property years of experience. This is going to be an empty string. Step 2 add the HTML. Now the HTML is very similar to the checkbox group. So I'm going to copy paste the HTML and walk you through the code. We have a label for the form control which is years of experience and then we have four radio buttons. Each of them have a label and an input of type radio. We also have the id attribute equals to the for attribute on the label. The value attribute on the input is also set and you can see I have also included the bind column group directive which is our step 3. The binding is with the new property years of experience. If you now save the file and take a look at the browser, we should have the four radio buttons and the initial value in form values object is an empty string. And when I select the radio button, its corresponding value is reflected. Our radio group control works as expected. Alright, now that we have a good understanding of how to work with various form controls, now let's understand how to submit this form data. We begin by adding a submit button to our form. So after the radio group control, a tag button and the text is submit. Now it is so happens that when the submit button is clicked, the form emits a submit event which we can list to using event binding. So on the form tag, we bind to the submit event, so on colon submit and let's assign an event handler called submit form. This submit form is going to be a function which we can define in the script section. So function submit form and the function receives the event argument. By default, a form submission will cause the page to refresh. To prevent that we call event.prevent default. And in the next line we simply log to the console the form values object. Ideally, you would want to send this object to an API endpoint as the request body. But for now, I just want you to get an understanding of how to get hold of the form data when the submit button is clicked. Let's save the file, head to the browser and open the console. I have also quickly changed name to be of type text rather than number. I am going to fill in all the form values and click on submit. If you take a look at the console, you can see that the object is logged with all the values that we have filled in. One last thing I would like to mention here is about event modifiers. Instead of writing event.prevent default, we can add a modifier to the submit event. So let me remove the event object and the corresponding statement. On the submit event, we can specify a modifier using the pipe character followed by the modifier name. That is going to be prevent default. If we now go back to the browser and submit the form, the page still doesn't refresh. Similar to prevent default. There are few other modifiers which I'll leave for you guys to explore. Alright then, that is pretty much the fundamentals of form handling in Svelte. Thank you guys for watching, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video. Welcome back everyone. Our next topic is the topic of reactivity in Svelte. There are two concepts to cover, reactive declarations and reactive statements. Let's go over declarations in this video and statements in the next. In the script section, I'm going to declare two variables. The first name is equal to Barney and the last name is equal to Stinson. In the markup, we can bind first name and last name. So as to tag curly braces, first name space, curly braces and the last name. Now take a look at the browser and we see Barney Stins now. It's also possible to achieve this exact same results using reactive declarations. There is a special syntax to this which is dollar sign followed by a colon. So instead of let or const, we use this followed by the variable name. Let's call it full name. This is going to be equal to first name followed by last name. Now in the markup, we can bind full name using curly braces. If we take a look at the browser, you can see the same output. So what we have done is composed a new variable from existing variable values. Full name is a property composed from first name and last name. In the browser though, both represent the same UI. Which brings us to the question, why would we use reactive declarations with this syntax 
when we can just bind variables? Well, there are few things to go over. For starters, full name is more descriptive of the data it represents rather than a combination of first name and last name in the markup. Also, if a value like full name needs to be rendered in multiple places, reactive declarations make much more sense. A JavaScript expression that is repeated in multiple places only makes it harder to maintain the code. Let's look at another example to justify this point. I'm going to copy paste a new variable. The property is called items and is an array of object. Each object contains an ID, a title and a price. We have Xiaomi Note 10 for 200, a OnePlus Note 2 for 500 and an iPhone 13 for 1000. Assume these are the items in your cart on an e-commerce site. If we have to display the total cost of all these items, we could do that in the markup. So as to tag, total is going to be items.reduce. This accepts a function which receives the total and the current items. And we are simply going to return total is equal to total plus current item dot price and the initial total is zero. And this is of course is total. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, we should see the total as 1700. Suppose you have to display this total on the cart icon as well as the order summary. You could duplicate this expression but as you might have guessed it would mean that you have to maintain the same code in multiple places. Suppose you have to add a discount on the order total. You would have to tweak your code in more than one place. Curly braces in the markup should be used to bind simple data and not perform complex logic. The right approach is to use a reactive declaration. So in the script section, define another reactive variable called total. So dollar colon total and assign the expression we have in the markup. Let's move this line after the items array. In the markup, render total. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, the output remains the same. And the good thing about reactive declarations is that they are automatically recalculated if their dependencies change. Let me explain with an example. In the markup, let me add a button to change the first name and last name values. So button, the text is going to be change name and on click of this button, we are going to assign first name with Akagami and last name is going to be equal to Shanks. If you now go back to the browser, you can see the full name updates since first name and last name updated. You don't have to worry about updating the full name variable separately. Svelte handles it for you. But what you have to know though is that the reactive system works based on assignments. So when working with areas or objects, direct mutation will not cause a re-render. Let me show that to you with the items array we currently have. In the markup, let's add another button to add an object into the items array. So button, the text is going to be add item and on click of this button. We are going to have items.push and we are going to push an item with id 4. Title keyboard and the price is going to be 50. I think 50 dollar is enough. If we now go back to the browser, we have the total as 1700 and the button to add an item. If we click on the button though, the value does not update. This is because there is no assignment. To fix this, we need to assign a new value to the items array. So I'm going to wrap this with parentheses and we are going to have items is equal to spread the current items and then add the new item. Now go back to the browser and click on add item and the total increments to 1750. Since the items have changed on the button click, the total is recomputed and the value 1750 is rendered in the browser. Again, you don't have to worry about letting Svelte know that it has to recalculate the total. Svelte will take care of it for you. So that is about reactive declarations. In the next video, let's take a look at reactive statements. Okay, okay guys, see you in the next video. In the previous video, we learned about reactive declarations. We use the dollar column syntax followed by a variable name to which we assign a value computed from other variables, for example, phone name from first name and last name. In this video, let's take a look at reactive statements. In Swell, the reactivity system is not limited to just declarations. We can also run statements reactively. The dollar column syntax remains the same, but what follows after is different. Let's take a look at an example. In the script section, we are going to use dollar column and this is going to be followed by a console.log statement. So console.log 
full name is first name followed by last name so this statement is depended on first name and last name which means it reacts to changes in those values if we head back to the browser we see the initial log statement that gets executed full name is barney stinson but if i now click on change name first name and last name are updated and the log statement is executed again since the dependent values have changed so full name is now akagami shanks now of course with reactive statements you can also have multiple statements by simply wrapping them within curly braces for example i can split this log statement into agreed constant assignment and then log the value of agreed to the console so open curly braces close curly braces and here we can have multiple statements const grid is going to be equal to this string then we console log the grid constant the behavior remains the same and you are not limited to executing simple statements like this you can even have conditions in your statements let's say we are implementing a value control display for our application the user can set a volume between 0 to 20 so in the script section i'm going to add that volume is equal to 0 and in the markup let's display the current volume and also add two buttons to increment and decrement the volume so button increase volume and on the click of the button volume plus is equal to 2 so the step size is 2 i'm going to make the copy of this change plus to minus and increase to decrease now this will work fine but the volume can go below 0 or beyond 20 to handle that scenario we can use a reactive statement in the script section dollar colon and then we are going to add our condition If volume is less than zero, alert can't go lower, and we reset volume is equal to zero. Else, if volume is greater than twenty, we are going to alert can't go higher. Volume is going to be equal to twenty. So, if we now save the file and go back to the browser, we can see that the current volume is zero. If I try to decrease the volume, we get the alert can't go lower, and if we try to increase it beyond twenty, we get an alert can't go higher. A reactive statement with conditions works as expected. But what is great about this approach is that it lets you define the event handler logic in isolation to the side effect that needs to be run. In our example on click, we just have to worry about incrementing or decrementing the count value. For the business logic of what should happen when volume reaches a particular value is separated from the event handler logic, which leads to cleaner and more understandable code. As you can see reactivity is pretty powerful in Swell so do make use of it when required all right with that we have pretty much covered all the fundamentals concepts in Swell now it's finally time to start learning about component architecture and all details that revolve around it let's start learning about components from the next video thank you guys for watching make sure to subscribe to the channel and i'll see you guys in the next video Welcome back everyone. Now that we have a good understanding of the fundamental concepts in Swell let's dive into the component architecture I know we did talk about components at a very high level early in the series but now let's go through the topic in a lot more details as they are pretty much what you need to build medium to large scale enterprise applications now similar to react vue and angular swell follows a component based architecture this lets you break down your application into small encapsulated parts which can then be composed to make more complex user interfaces for example a traditional website can be broken down into header site navigation main content and footer you can say that this particular applications have five components one for header one for site navigations one for the main content one for footer and finally one component to contain every other component the containing component is the root component and it's usually named as app component written in a file called app.swelt in your application each of the four nested components describe only a portion of the user interface However, all the components come together to make up the entire application. Components are also reusable. The same component can be used with different properties to display different information. For example, the site navigation component can be the left side navigation as well as the right side navigation only the data can change. Now, how does a component translate to code in our application? Well, we have seen that bit quite a lot. A component code is usually placed in a .swelt file and contain a script section, a markup section, and a style section. App.swelt is one such example. But in real-world application, you are often going to create tens, if not hundreds, of components. In this video, let's learn how to create and include a new component in Swelt application. 
Back in VS Code, you can see that I have created a brand new project called Svelte Components. To learn all about components in Svelte in the app component which is generated for us. Let's clear out the code written in the script section as well as the HTML within the main tag. It's only fair we start from scratch. Now let's create our very first Svelte component. The component will simply output a message hello Rahul in the browser. So in the source folder let's create another folder called components which will contain all the components in our application. Within the components folder let's create a new file called greet.svelte. This component needs to render the text Hello Rahul. To add markup, all we have to do is just include it in the file. So needs to tag Hello Rahul. Alright, we now have the HTML that needs to be rendered in the browser. But as it stands now, the HTML Hello Rahul is not going to be rendered in the browser. Because this grid component is in no way connected with the rest of our application. So what we have to do is import this component in app.swelt and then include it in the app component markup. In the other words, we need to register the grid component with our application. So in the app.swelt, in the script section, we are going to add the import statement. Import grid from dot slash components slash grid dot swelt, which is the part to get the grid dot swelt file. Now to include this grid component in app component, we specify the component as a custom HTML tag in the markup section. So within the main tag, we add the grid custom HTML tag. Now if there is no content between the tag, we can change it into a self-closing tag. Now if we save all the files and take a look at the browser, you should be able to see text Hello Rahul. Your first Svelte component is up and running. So that is about components in Svelte components, describe a part of the user interface, they are reusable and can be nested inside other components. However, we haven't quite seen how they are reusable. Let's learn about that in the next video. In the previous video, I mentioned that components are reusable. So you can create a component that returns any HTML you want to and include it in any part of your application. For example, let's say we need to reuse this grid component. All you have to do is include the grid tag as many times as you want to. If I duplicate it twice, save the file and take a look at the browser, you can see hello Rahul displayed three times. Although we are reusing the grid component, Duplicating it three times like we have done here isn't really helpful, is it? What would be great is if we could pass in the name of the person we want to greet, that way we are using the same component. We could greet three different people instead of greeting Rahul three times. This is where component props come into picture. Props are custom attributes you can register on a component which allow the component content to be dynamic. Let's understand how props work in this video. Our intention here is to pass a name from the app component to the grid component and render that name in the browser. To specify props for a component, we add custom attributes to specify a name prop. We simply add the name attribute to the attribute we assign a value. Let's go with the name Luffy. Similarly, let's add the attribute on the other two components as well. Name is equal to Shanks and name is equal to Levi. Okay, so we are sending some data to the grid component but how do we retrieve that value in the grid component? That is a quick two-step process. The first step, we declare a variable in the script section using the export keyword so script tags and within the script tag export let name. Here name should match the custom attribute we are passing in. The second step is to bind this variable to the markup. So instead of Rahul, we use curly braces and bind name to the HTML. If we now save the file and take a look at the browser, you should be able to see Hello Luffy, Shanks and Levi. Hopefully the reusability of components makes much more sense. Now that we understand props, we can define the markup and pass in the appropriate data that we want the component to use. Here app component is referred to as the parent component and grid component is referred to as the child component. Let's add another prop to make sure we have a good understanding of how it works. I'm going to add a second attribute hero name and assign the appropriate value pirate king, yonko and savage. And in grid component let's declare hero name export let hero name and now in the markup hello name followed by also known as hero name. Now if we take a look at the browser you can see that output is what we expect. At the moment in our app component we are passing in static values as props. But we can also assign dynamic values to props, that is we can bind values defined in the script section to props in a component. Let me create two constants, 
const name is equal to Rahul and const channel is equal to RDH code. We can now include another grid component and bind the two constants as props using curly braces. So I'm going to make a copy of this. Name is going to be equal to name within curly braces and hero name is going to be equal to channel within curly braces. Since the prop name and value is the same, you can specify the prop using the shorthand syntax. So just name and curly braces. If we take a look at the browser, we have hello Rahul aka RDH code. Our dynamic props works as expected. The next point about prop is specifying default values in a child component. You can assign a value to a prop, for example, hero name, we can set it to default and in the parent component, when invoking the last read component, we can leave out this hero name prop. If we now take a look at the browser, you can see that the default prop value is used by the child component. Hello Rahul aka default. The last point you need to be aware of regarding props is how to spread props. Let's say we have an object with name and hero name as properties. So const object is equal to an object name is Rengoku and hero name is Hashira. If you have to greet the Hashira, you would invoke another greet component and set name is equal to object dot name and hero name is equal to object dot hero name. While this works, Swell provides an easier way to provide an object as props by using the spread operator. So on the grid component, we can use curly braces and within curly braces spread object so dot 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 object. If you now take a look at the browser, you can see hello Rengoku aka Hashira, which is the output we expect. Now of course we only have two properties in the object right now, but you can probably understand the value this syntax brings to the table. When you have an object with 5 to 10 properties, instead of specifying all 5 to 10 attributes, you can simply spread the object on the component. Alright, this is pretty much the basic idea behind props and swelled in the print component. When invoking the child, you can include additional attributes in the child component, use the export declaration for all the custom attributes and then bind them to the marker using curly braces. Props are a key to reusing components in swelled, so please make sure you understand them well. Alright, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Alright guys, in this video we are going to learn about the context API in Svelte. Let's begin by understanding what was the need for the context API and then understand how it works by writing some code. Consider a Svelte application that has lots of components. We have app component which is the root component nested within the app component. At different levels are several other components. At the first level, we have components A, B, and C. Nested within component B is component D. And nested within component C is component E. And as it turns out, component F is nested inside component E. So we have three levels in total. The requirement in our application is that components A, B, and F are supposed to display the logged in username. That information is maintained in the app component. Now we have recently learned about components and props. Props allow us to send data from a parent component to the child component. So to display the username in the nested components, we need to pass down the username as a prop for component A. It is pretty straightforward. Directly pass it in as props for component D. However, we have the intermediate component B, so we have to pass down username as a prop to component B. And that in turn has to pass down the prop to component D. Now the scenario is somewhat similar for component F as well. The prop has to be passed through component C and then component E and then finally to component F. Even though component B, C and E do not need the prop, we still have to send the prop through them to be able to pass it to components further down in the tree. But imagine, if the components were to be nested 5 or 10 levels deep, all the components in between would have to forward the prop. This specially becomes a problem for certain types of props, such as language preference, UI theme and authenticated user which are pretty much required by many components in your application. What would be nice is if you could directly make the data available to the required component without having to manually drill down the props through every level of the component tree. This is where the context API comes into picture. The context API provides a way to pass data through the component tree without having to pass props down manually at every level. Let's understand this with the rightmost tree you see on the screen. Our goal is to pass the username value from app component and read that value in component F using the context API. 
There are two steps to implement when making use of the context API. Step 1 set the context value in the app component and step 2 get the value in component app. To get us started, I have already created the components and nested them at the appropriate level. In app component, we have defined the username variable and set it to Rahul. The same value is rendered in the markup and below this S2 tag, we have included component C as the child component. The import statement is within the script section. Within component C, we just have the heading child C component and below the heading, we have included component E as a child component. Component E again has a heading and component F as its child. Finally, in component F, we just rendered the heading child F component in the markup. Our aim now is to send this username value from the app component all the way down to component F and render it in the markup all this while not using props. For step 1 which is providing a context value, Swell provides the set context function. Let's import it in app component. Import from Swell the set context function. Then after our username declaration, we can invoke the set context function. This function accepts two arguments. The first argument is the context key. You could call this anything you want, but let's just call it username context. The second argument is the value which we want to set to all the children components of app component, that is username. Now that we are setting a context for our step 2, we go to component f and get the username context value. To get the value, swell provides the get context function. So within the script section, import get context from swell. Now using this get context function, we can retrieve the username. So const username is going to be equal to get context and to this function we specify the same context key as an argument. Our context key is username hyphen context. Once you have the username, you can bind it to the markup. If you take a look at the browser, we see Rahul from both the app component as well as component app. Now one thing I would like to mention here is about the two arguments to set context. Right now, both our arguments are string values, but there could be any data type that your app requires it to be the first argument. In fact, what is recommended is to not use a string as a context key and use an object instead. The downside of using a string is that different component libraries might accidentally use the same key. Using an object literally means the keys are guaranteed not to conflict in any circumstances, as objects only have referential equality. But this is pretty much about the context API in Svelte. It gives you a way to pass data to the component tree without having to pass props down manually at every level. Use the set context function to provide a value from the parent component and the get context function to consume the value in the child component. Alright then, in the next video, let's talk about component events. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. Alright, in this video, let's learn about components events in Svelte. So far, we have learned about props, that is passing data from the parent component to the child component. Sometimes though you might also want to communicate from the child component back to the parent component. This is where custom events come into picture. Let's understand the syntax and usage in this video. For our example, we are going to consider the scenario of implementing a pop-up. Of course, to keep it simple, we will not create a pop-up component with all the styling and markup. We will create a simple div tag with some content and assume it as a pop-up component. Let me explain the scenario before we dive into the code. In our app, we have the app component. This component will have a button to open the pop-up. The pop-up is a simple component with an if block to conditionally display it in the browser. So on click of this button, we will show the pop-up component. In the pop-up component, we will have some text and a close button. On click of the close button, we have to hide the pop-up component. Straightforward requirements. So let's head over to VS Code and implement this. Let's begin by creating a new file in the component folder. The file name is popup.svelte. For the markup, add an S2 tag that says this is a popup. After the text, let's also add a button whose text is close popup. Let's include this popup component in app component. So in the script section, import popup from dot slash components slash popup.svelte. And in the markup, add the component as a custom HTML tag popup. At this point of time, the popup will always be visible. Let's add a variable to conditionally render it. Let's show popup is equal to false and then wrap the component with an if block where the expression depends on show popup being true. 
so curly braces hash if show pop up and then close the if block since show pop up is initialized to false the pop up is hidden on page load let's add a button to set show pop up to true so before the if block add a button the text is going to be show pop up and on click of this button you are going to have an arrow function where we set show pop up is equal to true if we now save the file and head to the browser we have the button being displayed i click on the button and the pop up component is displayed the component has an h2 tag and a button now what we want is on click of this button hide the pop up we know that to hide the pop up we need to set show pop up to false however the property is present in the app component whereas the close button is present in the pop up component so what we have to do is to send a message from the pop up component to the app component asking the app component to set show pop up value to false and the way we do that is using custom events let's see how in the pop up component we begin by importing a function from the svelte library so add a script tag and import from svelte create event dispatcher after importing we call the function as the name indicates the function creates an event dispatcher so let's assign the result of calling this function to a constant called dispatch the dispatch function can now be utilized to send events from this pop up component to the parent component which in our case is the app component so on click of this close pop up button we are going to dispatch the close event we can name this event anything we want but close seems appropriate for our pop up now that we are emitting an event from this pop up component let's listen to it in the app component to listen to the close event we again use the on directive so on colon but this time the event is a custom event instead of a dom event and the event name is close as a handler we are going to set show pop up to false so when the child component emits the close event we are setting show pop up to false as simple as that if we now go back to the browser click on show pop up the component is displayed and if i click on close pop up the component is hidden this is pretty much how you communicate from the child component to the parent component through custom events now there is one point i would like to make note of regarding dispatching events from a component at the moment we don't have to send any data to the parent with a custom event but you might come across such a scenario so let me quickly show you how to pass data along with the event in the pop up component to dispatch we specify a second argument which would be the data it could be any data like a string object and so on but let's simply send a string value rahul as the data for this example now in the app component let's move the close event handler to a function call the function as close pop up and this function now receives an argument which is the event object in the function body set show pop up to false and then to access the data we are sending from the pop up component we need to access event dot detail let's simply log that to the console on close is now going to be equal to close pop up if we now go back to the browser open the console open the pop up and click on close pop up you can see rahul in the console this is the data we sent from the child to the parent component all right to summarize custom events import the create event dispatcher function in the child component and obtain the dispatch function by calling it using the dispatch function emit an event by passing in a event name and any event data in the parent component listen to the custom event using the on directive and assign the appropriate handler the data can be retrieved using event dot detail all right thank you guys for watching don't forget to subscribe to the channel and i'll see you guys in the next video